Moses Ready? We're going to do Proverbs chapter 3, and we'll read the first verse. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. So right here, the, the verse, again, like I said, the first three chapters of Proverbs are very much um, focused upon getting the reader ready to understand the book of Proverbs, to understand its importance, to see how one must look at the book of Proverbs to grow as a Christian, as a human, as an individual. So <clears throat> let's look right here. It says, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Well, if you turn to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, the Bible says in verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you may be thinking, why would the Bible say that the, let your heart keep my commandments? You know, isn't the heart just like a muscle that pumps blood through your body? Well, if you understand from this word, uh, verse that Jesus is saying that whatever is in your heart, that's why, you know, the Bible, um, that's why people in general, they are, they're always talking and saying like, oh, my heart hurts for this or um, this made, you know, made my heart weak, whatever it is. It's more of in, in a, um, in a spiritual context. And what the Bible is saying here is when you let your heart be right with God, when you focus your heart upon the Lord and make it your priority to keep His commandments, to do His perfect will, then whatever proceeds out of your mouth, whatever you do, whatever you think, it's going to be the right thing. It's just, you have to get your heart right because even, even Jesus says, you know, this people honoreth me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. So it's, it's not about what you say say and what you do on the surface because there's a lot of people that say and do what looks like the right thing but if their heart isn't right then then the things that come out of them when nobody's looking is going to be evil it's going to be wicked it's going to be different than what they're portraying in front of others so get your heart right let your heart keep god's commandments once you learn to um you know love what god says above what the world says then you'll finally understand what it's like to hate sin, what it's like to um, hate this world in, in a way, you know, in, in, in everything that's going on in the world. If your heart is right with God, those things won't affect you. Those things won't, um, won't lead you in any bad ways. So let's look at Proverbs 3, verse 2. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. So if you notice here, it says, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. We've gone over these verses in Deuteronomy 28 often, and where they're talking about if you keep God's commandments and you make your heart in line with his heart, kind of like David was, right? Right? David, you know, was a man after God's own heart. What that means is that he was somebody who would always seek what the Lord would want rather than what he would want or what someone else would want. So if you have that mentality, then God will have the mentality that he's going to bless you with long life, with peace, and as it says, um, and length, uh, and length of days. What that means is that the more you focus your will upon God's will, the better things will work out for you in your life. You know, if there's ever a time where, you know, I see something really going bad in a Christian's life, like, like roadblocks, constantly after roadblock after roadblock, that often tells me that they're just going down the wrong path. They're not going down the path that God wants them to go. So keep your mind focused upon God's will instead of your will, and then everything else that you want in your life to work out, instead of you trying to force the path, let God kind of guide you. You know, let God be, be put you on autopilot. <clears throat> and if you look at verse uh, four, three, it says, "Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart." So. 
Mercy and truth. You know, mercy obviously is, is huge for the Lord, right? He wants everybody to love their neighbor. He wants everybody to love their brother. So, sh and showing mercy unto the poor or unto people who wrong you. This is a very, very big deal for the Lord. He wants you to, to always show mercy. But notice he says, and truth. What is truth? Well, the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So, in order to have mercy and truth always around your neck, you have to do what the Bible says and write them upon thine heart. What that means is you are going to put God's word on your heart. It has to be a, a, a thing that is, that is engraved in you, right? When you have somebody's, when you have somebody's heart and you know, I'm drawing it like the world would draw it, but when you have somebody's heart and they're always watching like the news, let's just say black is bad and blue is good. If they're, you know, they're always watching the news and they have the world on their heart and then they're always listening to worldly music, so here's a little bit more. And then, you know, they're always hanging out with worldly people. Here's a little bit more. And then occasionally they read the word of God, like sometimes they read the word of God, just like that. What is mostly bound upon your heart? What have you written on your heart? through your you know, day to day actions, through what you take in. Mostly stuff in the world. So most of the time, you're not going to be doing what God wants you to do because your heart is filled with the things that you see. You know, let no, I will let no wicked thing pass before mine eye. You know, I'm not gonna, whatever you take the time to be written upon your heart is what's gonna proceed out of your mouth. So, but let's say you have somebody else or you know, if, or it's you, and you change your day, your day becomes different, and you know, you avoid the worldliness. You know, you're not listening to any worldly music. You're not listening. You're not watching any worldly things. You're not hanging out with worldly people unnecessarily. You know, like I know people have to go to work and stuff like that. Then you know, when you're reading the Bible. You're getting a little bit of God written on your heart. When you're singing psalms instead of worldly music, a little bit more. When you're praying instead of hanging out with friends or hanging out with other Christians that are edifying you, a little bit more. So then what's upon your heart? I know, and it doesn't matter what kind of Christian you are or how far along you are in the Lord. There's been times where you have the black writing and times when you have the blue writing. But how much more is your heart different, your mind different, and your spirit different when all these things line up, right? When you've read the Bible for the day, when you've listened to the Psalms instead of whatever's on you know, the, the radio, and when you've spent time with people who are also on the same page as you spiritually, versus the opposite. Your heart gets into the right mode with God and things tend to be better spiritually. You know, you feel better, you are better. So that's how you bind things upon your heart, by doing them often. What you take in becomes your heart. <clears throat> Verse 4, So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Notice how it says in the sight of God and man. What that means is that when you are reading the Bible and learning God's Word and learning scriptures, you will become a better person. Not just better spiritually, not just, you know, more in tune with God, but a better person in general. Like I've said this many times in other sermons, you know, the, when you learn to speak a little bit less, when you learn to be a little bit more obedient, when you learn to work harder, when you learn to do right by other people and love them and be charitable unto them, you are obviously a better p person and that's why you will find more favor, not only in the sight of God because you're doing what he wants you to do, but also in the sight of man because th these principles are, are what everybody wants. These principles are things that everybody desires to see. You know, who wouldn't want a person who is loyal, doesn't talk too much, you know, not overbearing, and, and, and works hard? Who wouldn't want that type of person in their life? That's why you'll find more favor with, with man. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And let, lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. These are my favorite verses in the book of Proverbs because too many people in, in, you know, in, anybody's, in anybody's walk with, with God, they, you will come across this. Too many people 
don't do what God wants you to do because you just think your way is better. Like, and often you see this, you know, obviously the more you grow in the word with God, the less it happens. But, you know, you see it with like worldly women when they first get saved or like they're first trying to clean up their life. They're like, oh no, but I know better than my husband in this regard. You know, I'm, I, I know for sure that this is the right thing to do with our kids or with our finances. And I'm just, you know, I'm going to take, even though my husband said the opposite, I'm going to take us down this path because I know it's better. Well, your thinking may be better in a worldly sense. Like you may think you have the right monetary thing going on or the right, you know, idea going on. But God tells you to submit to your husband. And that in turn is the better decision because in the end, your marriage is better. God will bless your decision. It doesn't matter if you think you have the right. To, and this can go with anything, you know, with men in, in work. Oh, I'm not going to submit to my boss because I know what I'm doing is going to work out better than what he wants to do. You know, there's been millions of times when I'm at work and I think that and or think or think I may know that what I'm doing would be better than the idea that my boss has. But I always go with whatever my boss asked me to do because that's what God wants me to do. It doesn't matter what I think is better. I need to know what God, God tells me to submit unto my bosses. So that's exactly what I do. If you're a woman and, you're, and you, you know that your thought process or your idea is better than your husband's idea in this, in this one matter, if you go with your idea, God's not going to bless that idea. Because God told you that your husband's idea was the idea you should have went with. He didn't say, go with the better idea. He said, submit unto your husband, no matter what, in everything, he says. So if you end up choosing your way over your husband's way, that way is not going to get blessed. Because God is going to bless whatever his will was. And it would have worked out better if you just did God's will, because God can make anything work out. God can make your husband's bad idea work out better than your good idea because you have God behind it. He can flip everything and, you know, gr grow your husband in some, some way, grow you in a family in some way. Same thing with the men at work. You know, if you, if you want to go with your route, God's not going to bless your route. He's going to bless whatever route is, is biblical and whatever route he wants you to go. And that's true with any commandment. So, you know, if you find a commandment in the Bible and you're like, ah, I don't know if I should keep this or I don't know if, if this is really like, it's, it doesn't really matter that much. Read these verses. You know, what, is the, what does the Bible say? It says, be not wise in thine own eyes. When you think your way is better than what God wanted you to do, you're being wise in your own eyes. Notice how it says in verse uh, 3, I'm sorry, verse 5, Lean not unto thine own understanding. If you have to put God's word here and your thought right here, and you don't really understand why God wants you to do this, you have no clue, or it just doesn't seem like it's going to work out, don't trust yourself. Just don't lean onto your own understanding. You want to know why that is? Go to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. <clears throat> or maybe it has to do with going to church and you're like, oh, I don't know why I have to go to church every day. You know, why can't I just go to church like once a month or something like that? And God tells you to, you know, not forsake the assembly, right? Don't forsake assembling yourselves together. And then you're just like, no, I don't understand why. Just go with God, God's way. Don't lean onto your own understanding. He has it all figured out already and he promises you it will be better if you follow his way. Look at Isaiah 55. What does it say in verse 7? It says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Those are the most important verses in the Bible. The Bible says that God's thoughts are above our thoughts. So whatever we think is right, if it conflicts with what God's word says, you're just not thinking out the whole plan. You know, you're looking at the moment. This moment, this idea seems right to you. However, if it's contrary to God's will, you're looking at the smaller picture. 
As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Imagine you had somebody in a watchtower, right? And they could see everything going on. Let's say you had like a big watchtower above your house. And they could see every street around your house. And they had a plan. And they say, oh, somebody's coming from over here. Let's do this. But all you can see is that of your front window. And you're like, no, nobody's coming. No, we're not going to do this. We don't need to do that just yet. You're saying that your, your limited view is better than the bird's eye view of everything. God always has the bird's eye view, if you will. And I don't I mean in in the fact that he can see time ahead, time behind, he can see the moment, he knows what's going to happen if this thing happens or if that thing happens, and not only that, he knows everything that's going on. So obviously just go with his will. You're always, if you are going against anything, if there's any conviction on your heart about something you don't know what to do, don't lean on your own understanding. Just acknowledge the fact that his way is better. You're looking at such a small, you're looking at like, you know, most people are looking at like this moment or this month or this year. God's looking at this lifetime, your life and his grand picture. You're just a very tiny part. The more you jump on board with his, the more your life will work out because he's going to look at your life further down the line. One bad mistake here that you think is, your, is right here can mess you up later on because you didn't listen to what the Lord had to say. <clears throat> Back to Isaiah 3. It says in verse um, 6, be, I'm sorry, verse 6, Eight, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. So, you know, when you listen to the Lord, it will, be, it will bless you with health. It will bless you with everything that you need. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall, be, shall burst out with new wine. So now because in the New Testament, there's no like specific verse that says you have to give 10% of everything you owe, even though in the Old Testament there is. People just want to take the, oh, I'm just going to give what, what makes me happy. You know, because God loveth a cheerful giver, right? And I'm just going to give what makes me happy. Well, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can not give at all. Or you can give 10% of all that you make, and you can see what the difference is. Well, God promises in His Word if you tithe, give 10%, he will bless you. But if you want to be the cheerful giver that's only happy giving, you know, a hundredth of a percent, or, you know, let's say you made $1,000 in a week, you want to give $10, then this is exactly what will happen. Notice how, it, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9. And, you know, people want to get on churches for, you know, telling their members to, to tithe and to do those types of things. Well, that's how God's house functions. You know, it's not like you're just, you know, throwing money into the pastor's pocket. There's things that have to happen in a church that require money, and God will find a way to do it. If it's not you, he just won't bless you for it then. Then you're missing out on one of those blessings that you could have. <clears throat> Um, Proverbs chapter, I'm sorry, first, uh, Second Corinthians chapter nine. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Look what it says in verse six. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So. People take that verse and say, I'm just going to give what makes me happy. Because they don't read the verse before that. If you sow sparingly, let's say, you know, your money is like seeds on your spiritual field. If you're only giving 1% of what you make, that's like having a, a huge giant field and only seeding one tenth of it. When you give the tithe of what you have or even above that, then that's like having a huge giant field and seeding the entire field. You're going to reap all those spiritual benefits and physical benefits. You know, God blesses you in more than just your spiritual sense. He also blesses you financially, you know, physically, emotionally. 
the more you give unto him. As long as you're giving 10% of what you're doing, you're doing what God requires of you. You know, and you know, like I said, nobody has to give. If you don't want to give, don't give. But this is what you're missing out. You're missing out on sowing more. I don't know about you, but if I were if I were, had a plant a field and I really wanted what was in that field, you know, let's say it produced my favorite crop, whatever it was. Like let's say you love figs and you just you can only plant one fig tree versus a hundred fig trees. I'm sure you'd rather go with the hundred. You know that you, you, the more you put in, the more you get out. God wants you to be cheerful, but He also wants you to do to to sow bountifully. Go back to Proverbs three. <clears throat> it says, "My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord; neither be weary of His correction. For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth, even as a father the son in whom He delighteth." So when you have children, you know, I don't chasten somebody else's kids, right? I'm not, I'm not worried about what everybody in the world is doing, but I love my kids enough to say I want them to grow up in a means that will benefit them when they're older. They'll have respect for their elders, they'll have respect for people, they'll work hard, they'll understand the difference between right and wrong. The parents who just let their children do whatever they want, whenever they want, those are the parents that don't love their kids enough. They're too lazy to love their kids, or they're too emotional to love their kids, and they can't just do what's right and what's beneficial for their kids to grow. The same thing is true with the Lord. If the Lord loves you, He's going to correct you when you do wrong. If you continue to do wrong, He's going to continue to correct you. That's why the Bible says, despise not the chastening of the Lord. If you're being chastened, that means the Lord loves you. Jesus says in Revelation 13, um, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I, I might have got that wrong. Revelation 3, sorry. So, Revelation 3. So, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. God, if He loves you, will correct you, make you go down the right path, and help you as a Christian. But if you are not getting that, like if you're looking at somebody who's like a, a Jehovah Witness or something like that, and they're living in this sinful life, and they're like happy, like spiritually, they're just not getting chastened because God doesn't love them. You know, God's not helping them out. He wants them to get saved. He wants them to do right. But only those that are saved and, you know, are God's children. And those are the ones he's correcting. As the Bible says, if you're not chastened, you're not sons. You're a bastard, as the Bible says. Proverbs 3, <clears throat> verse uh, 13 says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof of fine gold. So we've gone over this before in previous chapters, but obviously the more wisdom, the more understanding you have, the more, the more you come to know the truth of the Lord, then the happier you will be. I know personally, the more I learned about God, I know personally, the more that I grew in my faith, the more I was, you know, sp spiritually sound. You know, I was more at peace. When I was trying to live like half in the world and half in Christianity, it's a very rough road. It's a very, it's, it's very unstable. But when you put all your, all your, focus upon getting more truth out of God's word and, and working upon those things in his law, then you will you, it will feel like you found silver, found, found fine gold. It's that important. Look at it says, verse 16, <clears throat> Length of days is in her right hand, and her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Isn't that true? Everything that the Lord has you to do, the only time you are not feeling peace is when you're going contrary to that, right? The only time that things aren't working out for you is when you're not listening to what God wants you to do. You're obviously doing something that is, that is different. I'm not saying every moment of your day is going to be perfect, but you're going to feel the most peace when you're meditating upon God's Word rather than the things upon this world. You're going to feel the most peace when you're right with the Lord, right? You know, everybody knows that feeling when you're in sin and you're like, you're like looking over your shoulder as if somebody's there. You know what I mean? Like God is watching you and you know that conviction in your heart when you're not doing the right thing. That's not peace. Peace is when you're keeping God's commandments. 
Verse 18 says, She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord, by wisdom, um, <clears throat> The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens. So, God is so wise, God is so wise that everything he's done has established, you know, the earth. So, notice what the Bible says here. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. So, with his wisdom, with his truth, and with his understanding, he founded the earth. So think of how much you can do when you start to learn and think more like him. You know, scientists have tried to like recreate an ecosystem. What, what that means is like they tried to create an environment, you know, in a lab that would function on its own. You know, like they would put, they, would, they, they tried to create this in a lab, you know, picture a huge lab that had, you know, Animals, plants, water, algae, all these things that would, could just live on its own with no, no one touching it. Like the earth does, right? Like if nobody touches, the earth is just functioning. Nobody's like adding things in constantly. It's just constantly functioning. You know, all the sea life is there. Things are happening. And they, could, they were never able to create a perfect ecosystem. Something always ran out. Something always went wrong or, or something died off. God is so wise that he was able to create the earth, which is perfect, which can sustain itself. It doesn't, like, require things. Like, without technology and without all the things that we have, the earth is going to function fine. Even if, like, we weren't here, the earth would function fine. That's how smart God is, that he could set up something to where every little thing interlocks with another, like, you know, most people like know like one thing that helps out another, right? Like, oh, spiders, you know, they eat like this, this, and this bug, which is good. But you don't realize how every little thing at such a minute level is working upon each other. You know, you have like bacteria in the soil is helping things like grow out of the earth. Then those things that grow out of the earth can feed the, can feed the, the birds. And then the, those birds can feed the blank, blank animal. And then, you know, it, it all works in synergy. And that's all from the Lord's wisdom. So the more you understand God's word, the more you can come to the mind of God and, 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 and know more, not only just about, um, not about spiritual things, but about everything going on around you. The wiser you get in God's word, the more you are like him. And it, it just says that by wisdom, God founded the earth. There's just so much things that God knows that we would never even ha have the time or understanding to come to. Verse 20, it says, by his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop the dew. My son, let not, uh, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. That's so true, right? The more you know God's commandments, the more you don't stumble. You know, before you knew that drinking was sinful, the more you got into foolish and hurtful lusts, right? But more, before you knew that blank, blank, blank was wrong, the more you were getting into, you know, these, these things that were causing sin, you know, sin and wickedness in your life. So the more you understand, the more you grow in the Word of God, the more you read, the more commandments you keep, you keep, the better everything works out in your life, the more, the more peaceful everything, everything is. <clears throat> and then it says, verse 24, When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. So God is always working in the background. Go to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. When you're right with the Lord, it's like having a shield around you. It's like having... And, and the reason I say these things, it's, it's, it's not to... It's to motivate you, to desire to do the right thing, because there's so much in the Bible. Yes, there's a lot in the Bible about, hey, if you do this, this will be your punishment. But there's also, hey, if you do this, this is the good thing that happens. You know, when you're walking in the way of the Lord and you're listening to his commandments and doing the things that you know, just like the, the common things that you know are right, 
God is behind you. He's with you. Everything you touch is blessed. If you read the stories in the Old Testament, there's constantly times where, where it would talk about you know, Abraham, Daniel, King David, and it will say that he was blessed in his deed. That means everything he did was blessed by God. You know, everything they were, whether it was work, whether it was family, whether it was relationships, whether it was with their children, whether it was physically, everything that they just did, put their hands to, put their mind upon, God made the little things work out. But that was because they put God's commandments first. Look at Isaiah 45. And then when you're right with the Lord to that point, then this is, this is the mentality you should have. I'm sorry, I, I said Isaiah 41, right? Isaiah 41, verse 10. It says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So notice, the Bible tells you when you're right with the Lord, don't fear. Obviously, when you're wrong with the Lord, expect His chastening. You know, that's, when, that's a time to fear. But when you're right with God, when you're a saved Christian and you're doing what you know God wants you to do and everybody knows what God wants them to do to the, to the best of their ability, learn more and grow more and do better. But when you're, when you're living a life that is pleasing to the Lord, God will strengthen you, He will uphold you, and He will be there for you. <clears throat> and notice how it says, Fear thou not, be not dismayed. That means whatever you're going through, it's going to work out. Like, don't think that, oh, this man might do this, or this person might have this work out. God is the one who controls everybody's hearts. God is the one that works things out for you and, for, and, and, and can, can lay out those paths in front of you. Go to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Psalm 91, let's read verse 5. <clears throat> Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Notice what the Bible is saying here, that no matter what is happening around you, a thousand can fall at your side, pestilence can be at your hand, don't be afraid of it. Don't let it control you. Nothing is better than having the Lord behind you, because every single thing can work out. <clears throat> Go to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to read verse 27. Proverbs 3, verse 27. It says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in thine power of thine hand to do it. <clears throat> to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go and come again tomorrow, I will give thee when thou hast to buy thee. So, what the Bible is saying is, when, you know, I'm sure you've had this uh, instance, when you have money, and somebody asks you for money, and, you know, I'm not a big advocate of just giving anybody money, and whoever comes to you, you just throw money at them, but there are times where you have the money to help somebody out. What the Bible is saying, you know, you know, it's always that first inclination, oh, I'll do it next time, or I'll, I'll help you in, in a little bit, you know, when I get more things. I, the Bible is saying, if you have it, just give it, and God will bless you for it. When that becomes your mentality, when you have something and you're able to give it, just do it. Just have that mentality. And sometimes, you know, there's going to be people that you come across that are poor. Uh, you know, even uh, I, some select homeless people in the city, uh, I'll be willing to give money if I don't see them like smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol with it, or if I, I, if I truly have a good discernment with them in some way, I have no problem giving them some money. But don't just be like, oh, I'll get the next guy. You know, if you have it on you and you're willing to give it, do it. Be, be, show mercy, as the Bible says. Show mercy unto your neighbor. Go to um, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. 
Not much left. <clears throat> First John chapter 3. It says in verse 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shut up... Uh, shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? If you have what the world has and you have the ability to give it to somebody, uh, like especially a brother, as John is talking about, somebody who's saved, and they really need it, but you take, you know, you covet it, how, how do you have the love of God dwelling in you? The love of God would be merciful into anything. Jesus would give all that he had to others before he used it upon himself. So just keep that in mind, you know, if, if somebody comes to you, especially saved Christians that, that need a little bit and you know it's for the right thing, you know it's, you know, it, they're not like not working or something like that, like don't, don't like give to somebody who, and, and like perpetuate their, their, their lack of work or something like that. But if somebody's trying diligently and they, and they need, and they need from you, give and then God will bless you for it. And the last few verses in Proverbs 3, verse 29 through 34, it says, Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. So, you know, try and live peaceably among, among people. If somebody does, does wrong by you, that doesn't, that's not your opportunity to, like, find something that you can wrong them back with, right? If somebody does wrong to you, find a way to do good unto them. Find a way to pray for them. Find a way to do something that they didn't do, you know, uh, heap coals of fire upon their head, as the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. So don't just fight with random people. You know what the Bible's saying? Like, if, if, this, if a person hasn't, like, physically harmed you or physically harmed your family, there's no reason to argue and fight. Yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of arguments and fights that go on every day on the streets, that go on in people's cars, that could easily just be avoided. If, so, if people had the right mentality to, to do right by their neighbor even when they do wrong. <clears throat> 31. Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. So some people get the mentality that they need to um, that you know when they see somebody in a position of power and they're like ruling over people they kind of like envy it. They want what they have. That's envying that, the oppressor. And what the Bible is saying, if you see somebody ruling over somebody, uh, ruling over people poorly, and like, but they're, you know, like, like think of like uh, back in high school, like the friend, gr friend groups, who was always like the popular person, was the one who was like the bully, right? The one who like could like bully down people or make other people feel bad. The Bible's saying don't envy that person, don't value their ways because they're popular, because they're rude or bu bullies. Same thing goes in the workplace, same thing goes in the world. Don't envy their ways. Don't, don't just because they're in a position of power look at their ways as something good. Just see, you know, compare it against the Bible. Notice what it says in verse 32. For the forward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. So those who are proud and forward and, and oppressing, that's an abomination to God. Something that's abominable, God doesn't want to see, God doesn't want to look at, God doesn't enjoy but his secret is with the righteous. Those that are keeping his commandment, he, that's the ones he's going to bless with those little things that, you know, uh, his truth, so, you know, his, his peace. His secret is with those who are seeking him daily. Verse 33, The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. So when you're living in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, things will go right for you. You know, your home, and, and it means like, you know, where you live, who you are, the, your, your work, those will be blessed. But when people are wicked and not living a life that is, that is pleasing unto the Lord, everything that they do is going to be cursed. Everything that they do is going to end up going wrong. You'll notice that like if you're living in some type of sin and you can look back at it and be like, wow, those things really weren't working out because I was doing this. You know, the curse of the Lord was upon, my, uh, was upon me. Verse 34, Surely he scorneth the scorner, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So those who are scorning, they're going to get scorned by God. That's the, that's the last thing you would ever want. But those who are lowly and meek and willing to forgive others, then God is going to be lowly and meek with you. He's going to be willing to forgive you and willing to bless you in those things. 
The wise shall inherit glory. We know that. You know, the, the, when it says wise, it means those who understand the truth of the Lord, that you, know, you believe upon God, that God is the one who's going to save you. You're going to inherit glory. But shame shall be the, pro, uh, the promotion of fools. So everybody who's living foolishly in this life, not seeking the Lord, you know, not looking after God to get saved, to, to you know, keep His commandments in any of those ways, the only thing they're going to receive is shame. The only thing that they're going to benefit from is shame from the Lord. And that's the last thing you would want. That's why Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says uh, <clears throat> to look to other, look, look at, uh, let each esteem others better than themselves, right? When you look at somebody else and say that if you esteem them higher than you would esteem yourself, you know, if you have this attitude that, hey, I could do better, I could be better, and these people, you know, they're, they're probably living better than I am. When you have that mentality, then you're going to be humble, and God will bless you for that. But when you're like, oh, I'm better than that person, I'm definitely doing more than that, then that proudness, God is going to block everything in front of you. God is going to block those paths. God wants you to be humble. He even wants you, as 1 Peter 5 says, it says, submit yourselves one to another. Um, <clears throat> actually, just go there. This will be the last verse we look at. I just don't want to misquote it. 1 Peter 5. It says in verse 5, Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. So if you're willing to submit yourself unto others, and no matter what, no matter who you are, like Jesus submitted himself unto his disciples when he washed their feet. And he did that, because. and Peter told, Peter kind of rebuked Jesus while all he was doing. He was like, said, Lord, don't wash my feet. And Jesus says, you know, if, you, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And he said, wash my feet and my face. And the reason he said that was because Jesus was doing it to show other people, if I as God am willing to submit myself unto other people and wash their feet, who washes other people's feet, right? The, lowly, the, the lowest, right? The, if you had a servant or a maid, that's who would wash your feet. That's what Jesus was saying. That's the point he was trying to make, was that I'm willing to wash your feet how much more should you be willing to submit to others? Even if you think that you're right, or even if you think you're above them. And, and sometimes, you know, sometimes even as a, as, as a man, or as a pastor, or as a person at work, sometimes things will work out, um, it, it, will be, it will be a test of your humility to see if you can, can just be lowly in a certain situation. Like, oh, God knows that your way is the right way, you know? And this can be with anybody, you know? Even with like a parent, like a, a mother over a child. God knows that what your, your way is the right way. But sometimes, you know, just being of a lowly heart and not being too proud about the situation can help you to understand things better. The, the best way I could explain it is like, if your wife wanted to do something and you know it's your choice to do it and you were just like, no, we're going to go with my way because I'm, I'm the husband and that's how it goes. Sometimes, and don't take this the wrong way, I don't want women to just use this as any opportunity for, for, for them to get above their husband, but sometimes it is more beneficial to that person if you submit unto them because maybe they can't see the right way and maybe it will help them to grow in some certain aspect. And it's up to your discernment to say, hey, can I, can I be lowly right now and not be proud and look at the situation as a whole? What's going to go better? Is, is me forcing my way upon this person going to be better? And I, I have to do this often as a pastor too. You know, it should be that my way or the highway because that's how God has set it up. But oftentimes I'll, I'll do things or, or, or go about something in a different way that is more beneficial to you guys or, or uh, the request of other people just because I know that it will help things flow better. Though it shouldn't always have to be like that, right? What, what is God set up? But sometimes submitting yourself, being lowly, and having that meek attitude will help you and God will bless you for it. You know? So don't always just get caught in your position where you think that um, you, know, you always have to be right. If you esteem somebody else better than yourself, you're willing to you know, take the lower route sometimes. So 
That's Proverbs chapter 3. I hope you learned a lot from it. There is uh, so much that goes into every single chapter, so much growth, so much guidance. By the time we get to the end of it, I hope you'll have a nice foundation of just how to conduct yourself as a person. You know, there's not, like I said, there's not a lot of like doctrine in Proverbs. There's a lot of life tips, life goals, you know, way to conduct yourself as a Christian. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word. We thank you very much for this section of your Bible, Lord, that will teach us how to govern ourselves, teach us how to be, teach us how to grow. And we just pray, Lord, that you will allow us to be better Christians from it and that you will bless us all with a changed spirit each and every day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.